Um, yeah, let's talk about remote things. So, SSH on Windows. So, um, just now at the start, I got you all to uh, try and connect to the server, which uh, do you all still have the IP? If not, I can, I'll show it again. Yeah, so uh, menu, I just want to say that if, if you are on uh, Windows 10, 18, 03 and above, then, win then Microsoft has ported SSH to Windows and is um, included by default. So in that case, then you can just follow along using the SSH command, la, which is good because this SSH command will be exactly the same as the commands, the SSH in like, um, what do you call it? In the SSH in like Linux or Mac. So whatever you do using SSH here will transfer all the same. If you use putty, then the interface will be slightly different, but the, of course the functionality is the same. La. Okay, SSH keys. So what are SSH keys? So it's basically, um, like instead of using a password to log in, right? You can uh, you, you use the SSH key so that you then what happens is that the so your SSH server will send some kind of uh, challenge to your client and then you will like verify that you own that key and then like then if you own that key then it will let you log in instead of you having to key in a password. So of course you need to log in at least once or somehow. Uh, say that you, you need to configure the server side to know that um, like your server or rather you have uh, no, you need to configure the server side to like know your key la, first. So we'll go through how you generate a key and then install it on the server, right? So does anyone here use git? Yeah, if you use git on the command line, then most likely you already have an SSH key, right? Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about how to generate SSH key. Okay, so if you are on um, Windows, I'll cover that later, but let's cover on, if you're on Mac, if you're on Linux, or if you're using the command line on Windows, then, oh. Okay. Okay, so if you're using a command line, then let's generate SSH key. So I'm gonna do, um, so nowadays I'll recommend that you use add 25519. Why? Because the key size is a lot smaller, but there are still certain services that don't support uh, add 25519. So in that case, then you might have to create an RSA key, uh, like, like here. But I'll just demo with add 25519. So it will just ask you where to save the key. So if you're creating, if you haven't created a key before, then the default uh, location is fine. Uh, but I, I have my own key, so I'm not gonna overwrite it. Yeah, yeah whatever. Okay, then it asks you to enter a passphrase. So what this passphrase is, is the, to encrypt the SSH key. So why do you want to encrypt the SSH key? So that, um, like, in case some, um, someone else gets the file, that you don't want them to be able to log into all your wherever you go, right? So you just enter some passphrase and we'll cover more about this later. So I'll just enter some, uh, actually I'll just leave it blank. Yeah, then once you're done, then your key has been created and you're done. So if you went to the default location, then your key is created in this location. So dot ssh slash id at 25519. So that, this, this is what we call the private key. So this is actually the part that is sort of the secret. And then there's also this, uh, so there's also this public key, right, which is just at dot ssh slash id at 25519 dot So what this public key is, is the part that you put on the server, so let you, like, so that the server can use that to authenticate you. Okay, so, um, is everyone following along? So now, um, we have created our key. Right, okay, let me go through Windows. Okay, so if you're on Windows, then we use this thing called, okay, 
if you don't have the SSH command line, then you can use this thing called Putty. And there's this app called PuttyGen, which you can download. Right, so just now I showed this one. PuttyGen is just down here. Okay, then you can, um, you can just create a new key. So it's the same, uh, except it's just a graphical interface. So you just uh, choose the type of key, add 25519, press generate, it asks you to generate some randomness. Then after that, you can key in your password or passphrase to encrypt the key. Okay, let me just... And then after that, you just save the private key. And... Yeah, wait, hold on. Oh, I, all right. So, yeah, then you save the file. So it will work the same. Uh. So whatever you whatever you have generated with the putty key generator, of course, can only be generated using. Uh, can only be used with putty lah. Although you can convert it to a format that can be used by OpenSSH. Yeah, if you ever need to. So you just go conversions and export the OpenSSH key, uh, force new file format, and then you save it as the uh, ID or whatever, ID ED25519, and then you can put it into your .ssh directory. Yeah, but if, if you're just holding this, then so it's either you're using the command line or using putty. Okay. So how do you install the key, right? So um, okay, if you are SOC student, you can actually do. You can actually try this with Sunfire. So right. Um, so you know when you log into Sun, have you all ever logged into Sunfire? Right. So if you ever log in Sunfire, instead of keying in or your password all the time, you can just um, install your SSH key. Then the next time you Next time when you have to log in, you can just you don't have to key in the, you don't have to keep keying your password. So um, whether you're trying this with Sunfire or whether you're trying this with this uh, server, right? Okay, let me demo how to install the key. So uh, let's use your. Um, Let's use the credentials that I have sent to you. Or if you're using Sunfire, then you can just follow that. So the idea is just you just enter SSH copy ID. And then you just key in the same like username at server as you would. So I'm going to use U100. Right. So then now you'll have to ask you for the password because you haven't installed the keys yet. So you cannot yet log in. So let me just find my password. Okay, then it will say number of keys added one or two. So, uh, it will say one lah if you only have one key. Because I personally have two keys, so it, it will install all my keys. So now, if I just try an SSH, if I just SSH in, right, it won't ask me for a password. That's great. Okay, it will ask you for your key password if you haven't, if you don't have a SSH agent installed, which I will cover right now. Okay, before that. Um, I hate these slip on mics. So if you are if you can't use SSH copy ID, for example, if you are using like um, what's that? Pageant? Uh, no. If you're using Putty and there's no SSH copy ID, right? So what you do. Okay, let me just remove my keys first. So now my keys are gone, right? And so the instructions are actually here. So what you do is you make the SSH directory. 
then so okay, let me log, actually let me log out. <laughs> so just now when you created the when you created your key, right? Then you created there was a dot public key, remember? So let's just check what the public key is. Yep, so this is the public key. And you just copy it. Then you SSH back in. So this is the manual way to install it. Then, uh, okay, I need my password. Okay, let me copy this again. Okay, then now, I need to create the SSH directory. Which, okay, I've done that already. Then I'm going to echo it to the authorized keys file. So you need to spell it exactly that way. That means not authorized, like the British spelling. Okay, then now the important thing is that you need to set the permissions correctly. So what this does is change mod is change mode or change permissions. 700 is just the octal code. Um, seven, okay. So for this, uh, this one is just a site because I'm not exactly going to cover CH mod today, but uh, 700 means that um, the owner can read, write and execute the file. Then the second zero is for group permissions. So the group of the file cannot do anything. And the everyone else, which is the last zero, cannot do anything. So in Linux, uh, in Unix, basically, every file has a user and a group. And so these permissions apply to the user, to the group, and then to the rest of the world, like anyone who doesn't fall into either of those. And um, this seven is basically a bit field. So four stands for read. 2 stands for write, and 1 stands for execute. And you just add them up as you need. So if you want to have uh, read and write, but no execute, then it's 6 and so on. But anyway, this is uh, not, not the topic of today's. <laughs> so I'm going to have to CH mod 700 SSH. The idea is to prevent people from reading the SSH directory, because SSH will actually complain if your um, permissions are not set correctly, such that uh, mainly the authorized keys file especially, if the authorized keys file can be um, changed by the world, that means anyone can change it, then it will actually not let you log in using the keys because then it doesn't know if someone might have compromised or added their own key into your authorized keys file. Yeah, so I'm gonna set the permissions. And now let me show you that I can again SSH in without a password. Yeah. So you can actually do this with Sunfire. It is exactly the same. I mean, you just use your own username and sunfire at dot com dot dot edu dot sg. Okay. It's uh. Everyone okay? Okay. So what is the SSH key agent? So. Now, now that you have installed your key, you notice that when you are logging in, instead of asking you for your account password, now it just asks you to enter your key passphrase, right? So uh, we are lazy people and we don't want to do that at all. So we just want, so we have an agent. What, what the agent does is you load your key once, right? And then, uh, yeah. So for, for as long as your session is running, like maybe your entire, the entire time your computer is on, then you don't have to enter your passwords anymore because the agent has your key loaded and decrypted and it can just, um, yeah, it will provide the key to the SSH client when it's needed. So, uh, typically we configure, like you will configure your profile or bash RC, etc. like um, to automatically start an agent. So, I've included a link here on how to do this. Um, essentially, so what a profile in bash RC is basically something that is run uh, when your shell starts. But I am actually not going to touch on that today. 
Um, but the main idea is that you include a line like this in your. Or you just run this first. So this will select, this will add some environment variables, right? Then you can do uh, SSH add. Oh, um, by the way, uh, for those using Windows 10 uh, command line, this uh, SSH agent doesn't work on the command line, so I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, you may have to use, you can try with putty and pageant. Um, yeah. But on the Linux side, if you are using a, you on the Linux side, then you can configure a SSH agent so that you load your key once and then that's that's it. So this line will, or you you insert some line into your uh, profile, basically here, this this bunch of stuff. So this will help you start your agent automatically when your session is starting. Or when you run, when you log into your computer and open a command line, and yeah, and then like it will just persist all the way. And then once you have a agent started, then you can um, just SSH add, and you will load the keys, and then you just key in your password once, and then after that you can just SSH and so on. Um, yeah, I'm not, I won't demo this, but I will demo the Windows one. Okay, um, so just now I showed you how to. So just now I show you how to um, install this thing manually. So if you're actually using pageant, you will have to do it manually. And what you use instead of the stuff from pub is basically the things here, right? This whole, no, sorry, this one. Sorry, yeah. You will just copy this into the authorized keys, um, authorized keys file, and then you can, then what you can do with Windows is that you can, uh, you can use this thing called pageant, right? You can use this thing called pageant and then you just launch it. You can set it up to auto launch. And then once you once it's running, you can just say, yeah. You can just right click and add key. Add key and then you add the, you just load the key. So it works the same as the SSA agent on Linux side, yeah. It's just, it's graphical. I actually forgot my password. Is it? Oh, okay, it's test, okay. Yeah, so now it's loaded. Then if you use putty and connect, it will just connect straight away. It won't ask you for a password. Yeah, but I didn't actually install this particular key, so yeah, but you get the idea. Oh, how do you get the ID at 25519 to insert? Oh, okay. Um, talking about this. Um, yeah, so if you are using, I lost my mouse again. If you're using a uh, putigen, then that file is, so, if you're using Putigen, then it's this stuff here. You copy that, right? But if you're using the command line, then you just you can just cat. It's basically in this directory, like your home directory, .ssh, and then this file. So you just literally copy the contents of that file. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, whoever it was. Okay, um, do we have any questions? Okay, let's move on to port forwarding. So what is port forwarding? It, okay, port forwarding is sort of actually, uh, it's like a VPN, but light. So it lets you sort of redirect uh, um, like redirect certain connections over to the other machine. So for example, I have, um, um, let's say, I have a web server running on the other machine, 
but and I want to connect it from my local machine. Um, and the web server is only accepting connections locally, for example, for whatever reason. Uh. Then you can just use SSH port forwarding, and I'll just forward the certain port on my machine. So I will connect to that port on my machine, and then SSH is listening there. It will redirect the connection to the remote machine, and then you go to the appropriate, uh, correct place. Uh. So let's, let me sort of demo it. Um, and um, okay, I, um, if you all are connected to the, let me bring it up again. If you are connected to the SSH server, okay, I'm going to launch a server on, I'm going to launch something on this server, but it's going to be listening locally only, and then you, and try and get yourself to be able to connect to it, okay? Okay, so... Okay, um, it's actually listening to the wall, but I will, let's try and connect it, let's try and con uh, forward and connect to it from the, via, through the SSH channel, okay? So let me, let's show you how it's done. Okay, let me just close this. So um, you can try and, uh, try yourself. Just remember that the remote port is 8000, but I will show you an example. Okay, so so I'm going to say ssh dash l, and then um, I'm going to redirect my local, let's say seven 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 zero. Okay, this port is arbitrary. You can choose anything you want because this is what is on your local side. Then I'm going to redirect it on the other on the remote computer to localhost and I'm going to connect to port 8000 okay then I'll just connect to myself okay so now it's logged in and basically nothing is different other than you have this extra parameter here but yeah nothing else will appear different but the forwarding is being done so now if I go back to Firefox and I go to localhost 7770, ta-da, and I can see hello. So why don't you all try this and um, try and forward to port 8000 on this machine and see if you can access the, you can see if you can access the, oops, the hello, yeah. What's ED25519? Uh, ED25519 is uh, asymmetric cryptography, a uh, public cryptography algorithm system. So it's like RSA. Um, it works on elliptic curves, so it's, it's yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not that familiar with the math behind it. It is basically a public key cryptography system. Some, some kind of like RSD. Just works differently. It's not that important. If you're just using it, um, yeah. If you are doing like, if you want to know about the cryptography, that is a, quite a technical subject. And it's more, it's more about the math behind it, I think. It's not really a... Uh... Anyone, everyone able to... 
Are you all trying to connect? I think. I can't remember. Ah, okay. I have. I see a few connections. That's good. Uh, yeah, that's great. Anyone need help? I'll come over. Because I guess this is one of the bigger takeaways from this talk. Okay, let me go through. Okay, if you're using pageant, when is pageant? If you're using putty, you can actually use this. Uh, if you're using putty, right, there's this actually, there's also this functionality under SSH and tunnels. So it's basically the same. So you report, you forward the source port, uh, let's say 0770 and the destination localhost 8000 and you want to say local and then you just add it yeah so it has forwarded local 7770 to um, to the remote localhost 8000 and so hey someone's connecting it from outside oh wait no that's strange why is it listing the IP of... Someone connected it using the public IP. That's interesting. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, uh, in the meantime, let me just talk about the rest of the slide. So if you're, if you can, uh, if you're able to do the first line, right? If you go to do the first line, so the first line basically says that I'm going to redirect the local port 12345 to the remote localhost port 5679, right? Um, so what is R? R is just this in reverse, meaning that instead of redirecting from U to the other side, you, you redirect from the other side to U. So that's, for example, like, okay, in case you have something running on, uh, on your computer and you want to access it from the server, then you use R. And if you want, so yeah, it's basically just the direction. Uh. L is from local to remote, R is from remote to local. Okay. And of course you can do other things. For example, if you change this localhost to some other address, like say google.com, then you can connect to Google via this server. And so you're sort of using this server as a proxy or even a VPN of sorts, okay. Not really a VPN, but sort of like it. Okay, uh, this one doesn't actually work because of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, SSL cert issues, because the google.com, google.com cert is not for localhost, right? But the idea is there. Uh, so, is everyone okay? Oops. Oh. Okay, I'll just uh, carry on to the next part first, which is also more forwarding. So, okay, so SSH SOX proxy, um, you all know what a proxy is? Basically, it's something that will for like you connect, you forward all your connections through it. So it's sort of like a VPN light in a way, like it, it, It's sort of what um, those commercial VPNs are used for nowadays. That's basically a proxy for your connections. But you can use SSH as a SOX proxy. So what do I mean by that? So now, when I say SSH D one two three four five, it's going to open a SOX proxy locally, and then. Well, and then everything we forward it through the SSH connection and come out from the remote. So 
Um, so like some yeah, many programs can use a SOX proxy. So they can if you just set the SSH connection as a SOX proxy, then you can just forward your connections through it. So let me give you an example. Okay, so. Right now, if I, if I ask for my IP, if I ask for my IP, it tells me this. Okay, this is actually in NUS network lah. So now, if I go to like, So I'm going to use D, let's say, 8443, right? So now I'm set 8443 as a SOX proxy on my local machine. So what I can do is I go to Firefox, for example. Oh, wrong. You go to Firefox, or you can use Chrome, it's the same. You look for the proxy settings, right? And you go to Manual Proxy Configuration, and you go all the way down to SOX Host, you key in local host. So I use port eight four four three. You can use any port; it's up to you, as long as it's not being used, right? And then now, any connection that I make from Firefox is redirected through SSH. So if I ask for what is my IP now, you see that oh, it's actually this; it's changed. So this was the previous one. So this is the NUS IP, like one of the IPs, and now I'm connecting from the server. So, um, if you have if you have like a server in like uh, somewhere else in Singapore, um, somewhere else, then you could potentially use it to like um, bypass some geo restrictions. Not all. It's kind of like VPN, uh, Kind of, kind of. Um, yeah. But uh, SOX proxy is not as versatile as VPN because VPN will capture every connection. Um, like by any application on your system, uh, SOX proxy is like you have to configure, you have to configure your each application to like you know, configure each application to connect to it and use it. And not not everything will support a SOX proxy, but most of the major programs do. Like SSH itself supports using a proxy and, and so on. Um, Y'all can go ahead and try this. So okay, um, let me use a different example. So I actually have a digital ocean. I have a server that's running in London. Um, the fun fact, uh, I'm, I have a server running in London because Telegram's uh, data center is in London. So my Telegram bot is running on that London server, so it's like faster. So let me just turn off this uh, local Let me turn this off, right, and then I'll just SSH to my uh, London server, which uh, I'm sorry I cannot show that on screen. And then I'm going to, I'm not going to ask for my IP, sorry. But I will ask Google for my location. This is a problem when your when your connection appears as if it's coming from. A Let me do this off. Yeah. Like when your connection comes from a server IP, right? Like Google will be suspicious of it because it's like, why are you connecting from a server? Then I hear you. Annoying. Wow, it's taking very long. Okay. Yeah. So you see that I'm in London, in Slough. So yeah, let me just turn it off. Okay, 
Um, you all can try it out on uh, the. Try it out on the server, which let me bring out again. Yeah. Okay, let me turn off my proxy. And okay, let's move on. Um, everyone, okay? Okay, so Windows, yeah, Putty has all this. Um, you can do it with Putty. Yeah. Okay, X forwarding. Um, so if you're using Linux, you are running an X server. Um, so what the server, what an X server does is basically let it, it lets programs display things on your screen, lah. So the thing about the thing that's cool is that you can sort of let remote programs connect to your screen, your X server, and then they can show things on your screen. So if you're uh, like if you can um, like you can if you have like for example a remote Linux computer and you want to run a graphical program on it, then you can forward your X server. You just say ssh dash, dash x and like normal as normal as per normal connect to it. Then you just run the program on through the SSH session and it will like the, the, the window will show up on your on your own like your own screen. So um, if you so if you're an SOC student and you have Sunfire, right, you can actually try this. So let me just demo that quickly. Yeah, so I'm actually going to connect to Sunfire now. Okay, and I you see that I specified dash x. So now I'm going to, so I've actually tested this, and there are certain there are a few programs that exist on Sunfire. One of them is Firefox. So let's run Sun. Let's run Firefox on Sunfire. And it will be slightly slower. And so now we have Sunfire, uh, Firefox running on Sunfire. And guess what version this is? Anyone want to guess? <laughs> yeah. So Sunfire has Firefox, just version 2. This is a good old days from 2009, 10 years ago. And you can actually browse the web from Sunfire if you really want. <laughs> I'm not sure why you would do that. But anyway, this is just an example of X forwarding. So, um, oh, and the other thing you can do on Sunfire is like run OpenOffice. So if you ever want to like, I don't know why you would use OpenOffice on Sunfire, but you can do it. So this is running on Sunfire, by the way. And for those non-SOC students, Sunfire is basically a, like a server that SOC provides that uh, all computing students can connect to. So this is running on Sunfire. It's actually very funny. Yeah. So it's like 10-year-old software. And you can like, yeah. yeah okay. Um, there, there are more serious applications now. I'm just, this is just the most convenient example. You can try it, on, you can try it if you're using uh, Linux right now, or you have your own local Linux installation. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to close this. No. All right. And um, so if you're on Windows, you can actually, you can actually get an X server running. It's kind of complicated. So uh, I, and the, I, I honestly think that the use cases are quite low. So um, there's an alternative, like so. One of the alter one of the ways is using Sidewind, and they provide a Windows X server, and then you can integrate that with Putty to do X forwarding. Alternatively, you can use Xming, X M I N G. Unfortunately, that is not free software, so I can't demo that because I I, I don't have it. I'm not sure, and, and I think Mac has X quartz or something like that. Yeah, so if you're running on Mac, you can use X quartz and like do this also. I think. Oh, it, PC 
oh, this is X2 Go. This is not uh, this is not exactly an X server. No, uh, it says VC Oh, it's okay. I see. Okay. Um, Yeah, so I, this is a Windows version, apparently. I didn't manage to find this somehow. Like, I was Googling. I was trying to find a free Windows version. I couldn't, but apparently this exists. Um, I guess you can try if you're on Windows. You can use it with Putty and see how it goes. Yeah, but I honestly think the, the cases where you would do X forwarding are quite low because X as a protocol is not optimized for <coughs> network transfer, as in working over a network. So. Uh, it gets quite slow, so uh, you normally you wouldn't like run X over a remote connection because it is quite like the latency is quite high. Right, and oh, did I close my browser? Oh, that's my. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, one last part about SSH, SSH configuration. Okay, so if you notice when I SSH to Sunfire, let me show that again. When I SSH to Sunfire, I, I just key in SSH to Sunfire. I don't key in my username, I don't key in anything. Even though, obviously, my username is not my... Uh, computing um, SOC account username, but it works, right? And so what I do is you, you there's this file called .ssh slash config, right? Where you can insert stuff in and uh, yeah. So you, you basically what? You insert this into this file .ssh slash config and then you can, and after that you can just like, whatever you key in here, like for example, I key in Sunfire, it will just uh, work. Like it will replace this percent %h with Sunfire. And then, so it will actually connect to sunfire.com or nus.edu sg. And then you can specify like your username, um, or you can specify other settings. Like if you want to have a permanent forward for a certain server, or you want to forward x11 all the time for a certain server, and so on. Yeah, and it gets very convenient. So if you know, if, if you know about the SOC compute cluster, Basically, it's a bunch of computers with um, Xeon processors that, that, that a lot of cores that you can do like computations on, and they are all the all the server names basically are like X C N, and then one letter and then a number or one letter and then two numbers. So what this question mark is, it will match a character. So instead of just specifying all the different servers, I just do this, and then I can just connect to any any of the compute cluster computers without like, any issues. You all can try this with your .ssh config if you have. Although, and if, although if you're using, if you're using like um, Putty, right, then I guess this isn't that, like Putty already has like, Putty already like lets you like save connections. Yeah, so this is sort of like the Putty saving connections, you know. Uh, except it's for the command line. Yeah. So if you, if you don't want to have this percent %h, I mean, you can just say like, um, specify a host, and then specify a host name. As in, you can just specify a particular host, like, um, like let's go back to this example of, the, of, of this server, right? So, I actually set up a configuration block for this server, right? So when I want to SSH, SSH to this server, I can just HTI hacker tools too, and then I'm in la. Okay, I set the username to root, but yeah. So how do you 
if you want to do this for this particular server, like which, this one, the one that we are using, right? Let me show you the example. Let me show you the configuration for that. So it's just like that. Right, so I just set host, HTII. Host name is the IP that um, I need to connect to, right? And there are certain special characters you can use, like percent %h. Percent %h will be whatever you specify on the command line. And then you can specify username and so on. Yeah, so you can try this and just try connecting to this, to our server here. And then, uh, yeah, so it, this is just some quality of life things that make, make your life easier, so you don't have to keep Specifying your username and IP address every time. You just remember, like, okay, I have this server, HDII, I have this server, Sunfire, whatever. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, oh, okay. And proxy jump. So if you notice something, um, if you ever use a compute cluster, you cannot connect to it directly from um, you cannot connect to it directly from like outside uh, SOC. So if you're outside SOC network, you actually have to enter the network before you can con connect to the compute cluster. So one of the ways is to use um, SSH as a proxy jump. Like uh, so, you connect to Sun. No, you connect to Sunfire first. And then after that, you via Sunfire you connect to the compute cluster server, whichever one it is. So this way, this configuration will do that automatically for you. So you just use proxy jump your username at Sunfire, then you specify your username for the actual um, compute cluster server. But it's the same la. It's the same username. Then after that, you can just SSH directly. Like or it means not direct, but you just key in SSH this, and it will make the jump for you automatically. So this proxy jump con, uh, corresponds to con, to the dash capital J flag, dash capital J, yeah. But normally, um, you know, if you're going to do it often, then you just specify in your host uh, configuration file. Okay, um, SSH FS. Um, this one kind of requires you to have Linux. So I have installed SSHFS on the... Oh. I have installed SSHFS on this thing, on this server. So um, okay, you can try and SSHFS mount your Sunfire directory onto your user ID directory. Although Okay, uh, that's at your own risk because you'll be entering your SOC account password. But uh, you can try. I, I promise you I won't do anything. Let me just show you a demo. So... So I'm connected now to... Okay, I'm, I'm going to use my local account, as in my local computer, to do the demo, but you can try it. If you have Linux, you can do it locally. Um, if you are, or you can just try it on the server and connect to Sunfire from the server. So I'm going to make a directory. Um, let's call it X. And I'm going to SSHFS Sunfire. And then, then you have to make sure you have a colon at the end, because the colon sort of specifies uh, the directory that um, you are going to mount. So if you just leave it blank, it will mount your home directory. Meaning, when I say home directory, it's like um, where when you first go into Sunfire, like the directory that you are in. So like this directory is your home directory. So if I now SSHFS Sunfire, and then I'm going to mount it in directory X. So 
I just do this. Then now, if I just ls x, my stuff are there, and I can just access it like as if it were on the local computer. But this, okay, uh, this works mainly on Linux. I am not sure. Does does Mac have fuse? Oh, you can SSHFS on Mac also, lah. Yes. Yeah. So I think you can try this on Mac also. Yeah. It should work the same. And then, now if you want to disconnect that folder, then you just do f user mount dash u dash u means unmount, and then you just unmount the directory. Then if I go back and check what's in X, now it's just an empty directory. Yeah. So it's convenient, lah. If you're working on Sunfire, or like if you're working on a compute cluster, then you know um, sometimes you don't want to keep uh, manually transferring files here and there. Right? Then you can just use sshfs mount the directory and do your work as if the directory was local. All right. Um, Okay, Mosh. Um, okay, this is where I pull out my phone. Oh my god, it's four o'clock. <laughs> okay. So what Mosh is is basically a, it's like SSH, but the problem with SSH is like if you if your like network connection drops, for example, then your session you you lose your session lah. You just disconnect and you can't like reconnect. Yeah, like if, if you reconnect again, it's a new session. So everything you were doing is lost. But Mosh is slightly special. It's like it will work even like if you are if you change network or you disconnect for like five hours and come back that kind of thing. So. Um, I'm just gonna. So I have Mosh installed on the this server. So you can see that. Okay, NUS network seems to block Mosh, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'm going to demo it using my mobile data and on my phone, just to show you how I can uh, mosh to the server. Yeah, so you see now I'm connected. So I can just say, like, I can do whatever, like, LA, okay. So, LA, so now I'm connected still. Okay, I can do stuff. If I turn off my mobile data, so now Mosh will tell me that network is unreachable. And yeah, I can't do anything. Uh. But the moment I turn it back on, I, I'll, it's back. And I can still continue doing my work. And nothing is lost. So, pretty great. Okay. Um, if you're using Android, you can download this app. It's called Termux. Duh. Termux. Um, yeah. Um, nowadays, I can just do my. If I really need to, I can SSH into a server or whatever from my phone on the go and like fix stuff on the fly if I need to lah, if I need to and you know so yeah that's mosh so the thing about mosh is you need to you do need to install it on um, 
What's that? You need to install, you need to install it on both the server and the client on your on your own computer. But you don't have to have root on the server to install it. Although it's more convenient if you do lah. Oh, and the problem is like um, NUS network seems to block Mosh. That's why I was using mobile data. Uh, too bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, RDP. So this one I can't really let y'all try. Um, RDP is basically the Windows version of SSH or X forwarding maybe. It's basically let you access a Windows desktop remotely. So if you are looking at this Windows, right, um, it's not a VM. It's actually this running on uh, AWS. Um, it's just uh, I just started a Windows Server instance just to demo Windows stuff. Um, so this is running on RDP. So if you're a Windows and you want to connect to another Windows computer, you will use this thing called remote desktop connection. And then you just type the address of the computer, and then you can connect to it. Right. Um, if you're on Linux, then you use this program called um, FreeRDP. Um, yeah. But I think the situations where you have to do this is quite low. Uh, but I'm just you know introducing it. So if in case you ever have to do it, um, you can. Yeah. So and there's also a RDP server for Linux. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Um, officially, only the Windows Pro versions and above can be RDP servers. But there, people have written a tool to sort of hack it, I guess. Uh, do this at your own risk because it sort of messes with Windows internals a bit. Um, there are certain bugs where they got locked out from their session and they had to reboot their computer and lose all their work. Um, so do be careful. But I have tried this, it does work. I haven't run into problems, although I don't use it much. I, basically, I use it when I was setting up my laptop and I wanted to use my desktop at home. So I just RDP into my laptop and set up while using my desktop, like mouse and keyboard, more convenient. Uh, um, what's that song? Okay. Um, it's already four o'clock, so I'm just going to continue. Um, if you have to leave, please go ahead. I still have a lot to cover. <laughs> to cover. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move on. So this brings us to the. Uh, Debugging part. I think this part will go slightly faster. Uh, well, maybe not. Let's just get jump into it. So, okay. Um, how many of you have used GDB? Cool. Um, so, so GDB is a command line debugger. Um, if you have, so what a debugger does basically lets you like step through a program, you know. Uh, line by line or instruction by instruction and see what is going on uh, at each stage. La. So for example, if you have a program and like something is going on, there something is going wrong, right? Then you can like set uh, you can set a breakpoint at like the part that is going wrong. Then you then that means your program will stop running or will pause running at that point. And then it will like and then you can like inspect what's going on, so you can look at variables, like check are they, is this variable having the value that you expect it to have, um, you know, and things like that. You can ex basically it's just for you to inspect the state of a program because that's all a program is lah. It's a state and code operating on a state. So you can just pause a program at a particular line, and then say okay, check is this. Then you can like. Um, print certain expressions, you can print the value of a variable, you can look at a pointer and so on, and check if everything is, is it, is, is the variable having the value that you expect? And if not, then you can try and figure out why, and so basically that's debugging in a nutshell. So, um, there are a lot of, there are a list of common commands here. Um, I think it's easier if we just try it out. So if you could just SSH to the server, Right, and we'll walk through this together. So, another list of commands. So let me just briefly mention. So this step means go one line. Just 
continue one line in source code. Step instruction is basically step one machine instruction. So if you're if you know like MIPS or x86, it's just stepping one instruction. Next and next instruction, slightly different. So it's similar to step, but if you have a function call, it will step across the function call instead of like following the sort the code inside the function as well. So that's 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 useful if you know that, for example, that function is correct and you 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 don't care about it and you just want to inspect stay in this function. And then there's finish, which is just run all the way until the end of this function. Um, continue is like once you're done and you just once you're done inspecting and you just want to continue running all the way until you hit the next uh, break point. Okay, and then then there's one more thing that I think not many people know about, which is reverse debugging. So, what reverse debugging is is basically all this you you can um, go backwards in the program's execution. So after you, so what you need to do is you can just say record, and you start recording the program's execution. Then once you break, you can just you can step backwards by just using the reverse commands. So I think it will make more sense when we look at an example. So I have an example program, and it's I think it's obviously wrong because you see access zero, and then you're accessing null pointer. Yeah. So but just for the sake of Trying GDB out. Let's um, okay. So I have the example in test.c, so you can just copy the example and try it out. Or you can write your own program and debug it. So I'm just going to compile test.c. So dash g means generate debugging information so that the debugger can show us, um, like it can show us where each variable is and things like that. Dash o test, that means I'll output the executable to test, and then my source file. So you can run this on the server, by the way. And um, I've installed all the tools that you need on there. OK. So I've compiled it. And now let's run test and see what happens. So oh, segmentation fault, too bad. That means segmentation fault means that it access memory that it's not supposed to access. So in this case, we're accessing essentially a null pointer, right? So that's bad. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna move on to the example. So now let's so let's see how we debug this. Or oh. yeah. So we just run GDB test, right? Then GDB will load the program. Then we can press R, which stands for run. So you can just try help R. It will show you the full name of the command. Yeah. So I'm just going to use a shorthand, which is R. So you run the program, and then you will reach the error. So if we reach a segmentation fault at this. Um, reach a segmentation fault at this line. Right. Then like okay. So what we're we gonna do now? Um, we can show a BT. BT just basically shows a stack trace. La. So like which the stack of functions that have been called all the way from the top. So it shows so this basically shows that oh we were first in main, then main called access. Right? Main calls access. And then that's where the error happened. So that's what a backtrace or stack trace is. And then okay, so now we see the the error happened at line four. So let's set a breakpoint at line four. So this means that it will stop the program before line four is run. Okay, then let's run the program again. And now we stop before the error happens. And actually, here it already tells you the function arguments, right? But uh, for the sake of example, let's just print out the function arguments. So let's say I want to see what's that array. What's uh, what's array pointing to? Oh, it's pointing to now. 
right? And let's say what index is, oh, okay, index is one. And then I can also do something like, what's array index? Oh, well, I cannot access the memory there, right? So actually, this is why my program failed, uh, because it's trying to access memory address four, but it cannot do that. Okay. Now, let's try this again. So I'm just going to run GDB again. But now instead of typing R, I'm going to type start. So what start does is it will run the program all the way to the first line of code in main, like just before that line, so that you can do like set up some things before you actually run the program. So we have stopped at main. And now I'm going to turn on recording. I'm going to press C to continue the program. And then it will run all the way to my to where the error happens. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go backwards. OK, backwards one line is still there. Oh, now we backwards again is out to main, right? And we can go, we can go further all the way to the top. And yeah, this now we're back at the start. And you can like continue and run again and then go backwards. And so one more thing about uh, GDB is that if you just press enter, it will repeat the previous command. So we can just press continue and yeah. So um, why would you use reverse debugging instead of forward debugging? Well, it just comes in useful when sometimes you can't figure out um, like, for example, your error happens only when certain conditions are met uh, when you execute a certain line. But if you just set a breakpoint on that line, then you, um, yeah, you might, you'll get a lot, you'll break a lot of times even though those cases are not the problem. And so you might use something called a conditional breakpoint, right? But sometimes, like let's say you can't figure out what the condition is. Then you can just turn on recording and let it run until the program runs into a problem. And then after that, from there, you step backwards and figure out what actually went wrong. It's quite useful. OK. Let's uh, move on from GDB. Is anyone still trying? Um, anyway, all of this will be available online, so you can always experiment more. Okay, one caveat about uh, reverse debugging, of course, is like um, if you have to, if you if you do reverse debugging, that means it has to record every single step your program makes, so it can be it can slow down your program a lot, if, especially if it's a complicated program or big program. And you will use a lot of memory to store every single like change in state. Okay, let's move on to S trace. So what S trace does is um, it basically just shows you the operations that the program is making, like the syscalls the program is making. Um, a syscall is basically a call that the program makes to the operating system. So uh, you will learn more about it if you take your OS course, right? Uh, it's way out of scope of this talk. But I'm introducing the tool S trace so you have an idea of what it does. So let's exit GDB. And let's use this other example program. So I have I already have it compiled. So I'm just gonna S trace. So once you have this program, basically it's just hello world, right? So I'll just show you that it does it prints hello world. And now if I ask trace, wow, there's a lot of stuff here. Right? So what S trace does is basically you list every single syscall that the program does. So there's a lot of syscalls going on, but this is all like loading the program and so on. And basically our program only starts here when it's writing hello world to standard output. Yeah, so um, the, can't, I can't explain the output of this, but if you want to know what a particular syscall does, for example, 
what does uh, BRK do? You can always type man to BRK. So two stands for the, like when you type man, man is the command to pull up manual pages in Linux. Um, so there are different manual pages, but man2 in particular is the one for Linux specific things. So we can look at man2 BRK and BRK. So this is something to do with allocating memory. La. And or we can look at what is write. So write is uh, writing something to a file descriptor and so on. Yeah. So um, you can use strace to figure out like maybe something is going wrong, like it's opening a file, but maybe um, or maybe your program is not loading, and then you want to figure out why. You can use strace and maybe see that oh the file is trying to open a file, but it can't find the file, or it's not like you get permission denied or something like that. Okay. Okay. Then there's also L trace. So S trace traces system calls. L trace traces library calls. Library calls meaning like um, library calls meaning things like calls to printf, etc. Those are library calls. So those library functions will call will make sys calls to actually do the things. So if we do L trace. Then we see that, oh, okay, it just calls puts, right? Yeah, so that's all it does. So it's again quite useful, like you can see exactly what a program is doing, and it, you know, it, maybe it's not doing something you want it to do, and so on. Then you can um, figure out from there. Okay, and if you're using Windows, then there's this thing called Procmon. Uh, which uh, is a we'll also list down what like what the program is doing, and you know like it's opening a file, it's, or it's closing a file, open a file, and so on. Okay, um, Windows calls it create file, but it basically it's just it's just opening a file. I've linked to it here. Okay, um, time. So what time does, uh, essentially it just uh, tells you how long a program takes to run. So by time, hello. Yeah, it just takes like no time at all. Sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. If I time hello, then it's basically taking no time and, and so on. La. Yeah, so the output of time is basically like real, Real means the actual time that it has taken, like, like clock time, like real time. <laughs> um, user is like the amount of CPU time it has spent uh, in user space, and system is like the amount of time that is spent by the operating the OS in doing work for that you have requested. So if you're like if you need to benchmark something, or like figure out how long your algorithm takes to run, you can use time. Perf. So um, this one goes in quite deep into like uh, like the performance um, thing. So like uh, you see things like it will count for you like the page faults, number of instructions, and so on, uh, branch branch misses. So if you're really optimizing a program, like when you're writing a game, for example, you will use a tool like this that tells you like um, you know uh, page faults. Um, Branches. So uh, this is out of scope again, but I'll just explain what like page fault means that um, your program had to access something from memory, right? Uh, instead of from the CPU cache, it had to go out to memory and access it. So that will slow it down a bit. Then branch is like we have a if and if else. So the if will be a branch most of the time, and then a branch miss is basically when like because uh, your CPU. Modern CPUs nowadays will predict branches to try and uh, speed up a bit. So, because uh, if it predicts correctly, then like uh, instead of waiting for the result of the branch or computation, it will just go ahead first. And if it turns out to be wrong, that's called a branch miss. 
or prediction failure, uh, wrong prediction, then it has to undo. So normally when you're writing a program you, and you want it to be, you're optimizing for speed, then you want to reduce page faults and you reduce branches uh, and branch misses, of course. Yeah. So this is just to measure statistics. Hey, ProcFS. So ProcFS is something that will uh, to tell you about um, So ProcFS is a, it's a Linux thing that tells you um, information about processors and the kernel. So there are some useful files in Proc that um, you may come in useful uh, one day. Um, like for example, you have uh, CPU info. It'll tell you about the CPUs in your system. Or you can actually use LSCPU for that. Uh. It's the same actually. Um, you can look at the kernel command line if you need it. This is basically what the kernel was booted with, Linux kernel. Um, this is just some information available, and there's also like your kernel um, configuration available in PronGFS usually. But there's some the main, the most of the information in PronGFS is about the processors running in your system. For example, um, so if you want to, so what PID stands for is process ID. So process ID is just a number identifying each process. Uh. And you can like use a, you can go to proc self, which is a special folder just for the current process. Okay. And in proc self, you can look at like, for example, what command line was used to run the program. So like, if I just cat, yeah, so, oh, my program was just run as bash and so on. Or you can like um, you can look at the processor's current directory, like where is it? So since I am looking at myself, right, and the current directory is actually in like its own proc fs directory, you can look at the like where is the executable of the program. So the current program is bash. So I'm looking at uh, well, my program is bash lah. Then you can also look at um, like what files does the program have open. So, yeah. So my my bash has op is open um, the pseudo terminal. So pseudo terminal is basically like my this screen la. So yeah, I mean it's my shell ma. So it's opening this. So you can look at um, other processors. For example, like um, I don't know, like one, and then you can like let's look at what files this has open. So it's open a lot of sockets. Um, and dev now, and it's open dev key message. Yeah. So this is just for you to also to inspect what a what a program is doing, or what it has open, um, how the program was run. So for example, if you use another program like, so this program was run as or oh, init, and where's the executable? You can just check. Um, it's actually this this program. Okay. But normally. Right, we wouldn't use, uh, we wouldn't like look at this information directly. So instead, we we'll use tools like top or ps, which will present it in a more um, convenient format. Um, let's just look at top. So I'll cover top in a further slide later on. But basically, top looks like this, and you can just look at the processes running. So you see, just now we are looking at pit one which was system D, so yeah, it's system D. Uh. So I'll cover top a bit more in detail in a later slide. So let's just move on first. Okay, so let's talk a bit about blogging. So um, like when you are looking at a system that is going wrong, right, then like you might want to figure out like what's, like why is the system going wrong or what's broken um, and like, a lot, of time, a lot of times, the first thing you do when something is not working is just look at the system log. Because that might give you some clues as to like, you know, what, what, what exactly happened. Like it might have spit out some error message to a log, and so on. So, 
So there are a few commands on Linux to look at the system log. So can you can use like a D message, right? D message will tell you the kernel log. So for example, just now my program was crashing. Oh, someone tried running the program on uh, yeah. So just now the program that you all run it crashed, right? So that will also put an entry in the kernel log. It said sec fault at somewhere here, and so on. And Yeah, so this is like, um, then there's also, and uh, this number here is like the seconds from boot, so when the system was first started. Yeah, so this here is just the boot log. Uh. And then after that, like, you know, programs that are running. Then you can also look at journal CTL. So I think most Linux systems nowadays run on systemd. So systemd systems all will use this, um, this thing called systemd journal d, which is basically something to save the logs of all the, all the logs of a system together, and you can use journal ctl to view it. So what I usually like to do is use um, the b flag, because I only want to look at the current boot, like when I from when I last turn on the system all the way. Because journal ctl will save all the logs forever. So if your system is quite old, then you have a lot of logs to look through. So you just look at the current boot, and then maybe. Um, I'll look at the, oh, okay, I'll jump, okay, the thing about B is it will take a, it takes an argument also, but if you leave off the argument, then it's the current boot, but you can like look at the previous boot and so on, but if you just want to, so if you want to specify another option, you have to do it before dash B, or, oh. so normally I just do EB, which means I want to jump to the end of the log at the current boot, so then you can look at the, all the things that have been happening all the things that have been happening on the system. So like, oh, this system, this thing crashed, um, somebody logged in, another person logged in, another person logged in, and so on. Where does journal D store all the logs? Oh, it's in, um, so all the, all the like logs of the current boot are in run. Ah, damn it. Oh, run log. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, system, so it's run, it's in run systemd journal. Then, once they are persisted, they go into var log um, journal. So run is actually a uh, in-memory file system. La. Um, and then, once in a while, journal D will flush everything or just save everything to your hard drive. So when it's, when it's running, it's just in run systemd journal. Then it gets flushed into the uh, var log journal. It's safe in a binary format. Like, so some people don't like it because it's not, um, you have to use journal CTL to read it instead of like, you know, in the past where everything was plain text, then you could just use any tool and open it up. So yeah, there's a lot of things in a, so for example, sometimes like uh, my network connection will randomly drop and then I will be like, okay, what's happening? And the first thing I'll do is like open up journal CTL and check the logs because like my network connection, um, my network manager will tell, well, when it's doing stuff, it will, it will output into the log. Like when, it, when the network, when my connection drops and so on, then it will say, oh, connection drop. And then when it's trying to get a new IP, it will, it will, it will basically everything goes in a log. So I know exactly what is going on and why my network drop. And like in the past, my laptop, like this laptop, um, used to have issues with like USB 3, um, what do you call it? Uh, Ethernet dongles, right? So um, like the driver will start airing out. So I would, whenever that happened, I will know cause I will just look at the kernel log. So journal CTL, you can use dash K and it will just output the kernel log. So it's actually the same as D, M, D message. La. So I'll just use KB and then like, actually I use KEB to jump to the end and then it'll just show me like, it will show me right, when, the, when the driver starts to error, it will just show me that, it will, show me, it will just show me a bunch of USB errors and then I know, okay, I just need to plug out the, 
uh, the dongle and plug it back in. I, I didn't manage to fix it. Okay. So if you're, yeah. So other, some programs don't use the system log. So they output to their own log files and those files will be in, generally they'll be in var log. So you can see here like um, Pacman, which is the up package manager. It has its own log here. And like there's also like, um, there's also other logs here like last log and btem. These are like login logs. So you can actually look at them using last. So when they each user last login um, and so on. And one useful tool is to use tail-f. So if you ever need to like, um, okay. So let me just, I'm gonna tail this test file. And then now if I, I'm going to append to this, um, so you'll see that it appears and, oh, okay, I need to, <coughs> oh, okay, I need to append it actually, yeah. So the difference between one arrow, one arrow will just overwrite the file with this content. If you use two arrows, then you will append to that file. So every time new content appears in a file, it will just show immediately. So you can use this to follow a log file as, you know, more stuff is added in, yeah. Or with journal, with journal CTL, you can use dash F with whatever it is. So like, yeah, for journal CTL. So now I'm following the system log and if I log out, then you will output some stuff. Oh. Okay. So if you're on Windows, of course, there's a log too. Although, I would say the Windows log is much more cumbersome to read. Like, look at this. Like, I, I, and there's a lot of noise in it. Like, I, I don't... Windows has a lot of background things that are running. I honestly don't like it. But when there are, there are still, like, important things that go in there. Like, if your, if your kernel of you, if your computer BSOD, it um, will output an um, entry into the log. So sometimes you can go and look at there and see. You might have a hint of what went wrong. For example, if your graphics driver crashed, which is a very common thing in Windows, right? Um, then you will, there will be an entry there, and you can then you will know that oh, your graphics driver crashed. That's why your computer uh, rebooted or BSOD. A BSOD stands for Blue Screen of Death. Uh, <coughs> which, by the way, they are sort of considering adding to Linux, like. Instead of having a random crash dump, they're going to add a nice screen, which I, I don't know if it will be blue, but they're adding something like it, or they're considering. Uh, I'm not sure what people think about it. Okay. Okay, so just now I mentioned top, so let's look at top. So these are two tools. One, top, one of them is htop, and the other one is... Um, one is htop, and one is top. Um, they are both sort of perform the same functionality, they just have a different interface. So what I, I prefer to use top, um, I, I guess just because top is usually installed more often than htop, right? And so some of the tools, and basically top, you just, you just type top, you open it up, and then you can like, just press this, there are a lot of keys, but you can press help, and then it will tell you exactly all the commands. But some of the common things I use are like v, so if you press V, you go into tree mode. So what this means is like, you can see like which process started. So like systemd is like the parent started everything. Then it started this stuff. And then we have like a few SSH servers running. Oh, a lot of SSH servers running. And so on. Okay, it gets quite slow. <laughs> but yeah. So you can see, for example, um, sometimes if your computer is suddenly very slow, then you maybe you want to figure out like what process is um, taking up all your um, CPU time, or maybe you want to look at like um, 
is Firefox eating up or is Chrome eating up all my system memory? Then you go down here and look at your uh, percent memory column and so on. Okay, you can press F and then from here you can like choose. So you just press space and then you can like turn on and off certain things. Like if you don't care about like uh, CPU time or you don't care about nice value or priority, then you can just do that. Then when you're done, you just press escape and yeah. So you see some of the columns are missing now. I turn it off. You can like, oh, you can like turn on, you can press Z to turn on color, which I, I use it in this mode like, personally. Um, you can press C to change it to like command line. So if you want to see what command line, um, what the command line instead of the, just the name, right? And finally, you can use the, can use this uh, left or right arrow to change the sort. So if you want to sort by pit, for example. Yeah. So now I'm sorting by pit. Then you can like change to sort by username. Um, Am I actually sorting my username? I can't see my sort column. Oh, now I'm sorting my memory usage, by CPU usage, and so on. So now I'm sorting by username, and yeah. Yeah, and So HTOP is actually quite similar. It just has a slightly different interface, which might be more intuitive, I guess. And then you can like, you just press the keys and then it will let you do like, you just use arrow keys and then the function keys to do stuff. Yeah. So just pick a poison. Oh, and one more thing about top is that once you configure it, so for example, I like it like this. So once you are done configuring it, you can press W. Um, no, sorry, Shift W. If you press Shift W, it will just save the this configuration. So the next time you open top, it will be this way. La. So if you're on um, if you're on Windows, right, then you will just use Task Manager, la, I guess. <laughs> See me a moment. again. Yep, so if you're on Windows, then, well, Windows, you can just use Task Manager, like that, that exists. Uh, personally, I prefer this tool called Process Hacker. Uh, it shows you more details and it's more powerful. It's similar to Top, although because it's called Process Hacker, it actually can do stuff like um, write the process memory and look at, you know, a lot of things, it's, it's quite crazy. I, like you, you see here, I can like, uh, I can right click this and like free the memory, which, uh, okay, I won't do that because it'll probably crash the process, but yeah. So process hacker is sort of like the, it does everything that all these commands that I'm going to introduce will do. Um, so th this sort of illustrates like, uh, small difference between like uh, Windows and Linux. So Windows, Windows sort of has one tool to do many things. Linux or the Unix philosophy, like, as they like to call it, is to have small tools that do uh, simple things, but they do it well. Yeah, but you know, if you prefer a graphical interface, then yeah, you have this. Um, when I'm on Windows, I just use this. In the past, when I worked on Windows primarily, and you can install it and make it replace your task manager. So uh, by the way, if your Windows Control Shift Escape opens task manager directly and quite useful in case you need to kill something. Okay. So let's look at LSOF quickly.
Hmm. Okay, so what LSOF does is you can just list if you just type in LSOF, it will give you a bunch of files. Uh, it will give you a lot of things. Basically, it's just listing every single thing that is open by every single program. Oh, I can't even stop it. <laughs> it's lagging. Okay. Uh, but like, let's say you want to see what is. If you just want to see what is opening like a certain file, then you just type LSOF of that file. So let's say I just want to look at this file, um, the current directory. Then I see okay, Bash is using this directory, um, and LSOF, <coughs> LSOF, LSOF itself is using this current directory, and so on. Or if you want to list, like, um, let me use, okay, let's, if I want to find out what files are opened by PIT1, then I can just look at this. Oh, okay, it's opening these files. It's opening the journal, and so on. Okay. Um, then there's also F, there's also this tool called Fuser, F user, file user. So it's they are both similar tools uh, but I think F user is slightly more commonly installed, but you can use whatever you like. So Fuser just works the same way. Like you can just um, figure out, you can just type this, and then it will say what is using a particular file. Yeah. So. So this this is the PID. Uh, PID. The output no so Fuser the output is slightly easier to use in a script if you're using a script compared to like this. Yeah. And so if you want more verbose output then you can do like this or like the dash V. So it lists like um, okay, so this directory is being used by bash, yeah. So, and if we go to Windows, if you need to find out, if you need to find out what file is being used by, if you need to find out what file is being used by a process, you can just always, and like, okay, let's use a random, like, let's see pageant. So, Pageant is being used by, oh, rather, Pageant is using, you just go down to handles, and then you can see all the files that it has open. And if you want to be evil, you can like, uh, let's close this file. Oops. Yeah. And if you need to find out, like, what, like, let's say, okay. Like, let's see, let me just create a new file and, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to create a file. I'm going to save it. Now I want to try to delete the file. Oh, okay, Notepad doesn't lock the file anymore. Um, but, you know, in Windows, sometimes, like, you want to delete a file, but you cannot because something is using it. So what you can do is, using Process Hacker, you just go, you just go to, find handles, and then you key in the file, just key in the file name, and then you can just click find, and then you f like figure out what, like for example, I want to figure out what's using pageant.exe, then we can just key that in, and then it will tell me everything that is using uh, pageant.exe. Like let's say I want to delete, uh, I want to delete this file, but I can't because it's open. Yeah. So sometimes Windows will tell you what file is open in, sometimes it won't. So when it doesn't, then you can use a process hacker to like figure out what file is open. It's the same as LSOF or Fuser. Lah. Okay. Um, now we have LS block and DF. So LS block is basically like um, it lists you the disks on your system. So on this system, I only have one disk and it's two partitions, right? And then if I want to look at the free space on the, if I look at what free space the system has, then I use um, DF. Yeah, 
So this just list tell me what um, like all the file systems I have open, and how much free space there is. So this dash h means to output in a human readable format. So size is like how much like the how do you say like the the total size of the system the file system use is you know, how much space is used how much is available and the percentage and where this file system is located. So like VDA one is located on slash means it's the root lah, and like I have other file systems mounted on these directories. So in Windows it will be drive letters. In Unix we have a unified directory means there's no drive letter but everything is under one unified hierarchy, and things are mounted in under folders under the unified you know hierarchy. And actually in Windows you can also mount drives under folders also, which um, I will show using disk management. So if you go to disk management, so if you use Windows a lot, then there's one shortcut that you should know, which is the Windows key and X. That opens up this menu, which has quite some useful things. Like if you need command prompt, or you know, then we can just go to disk management to see like the disks. And like if you need to like, change drive like so this also lets you other than looking right you can also like modify stuff um, but I won't go into that and you can also like like if you ever need to mount a drive under a specific folder right then you can do that also it's, you can also it's not just the drive letters in Windows okay um, then we have a DU So DU is basically a tool to like summarize your disks, like how much, what's the size taken up by the files in a directory. So if I just do like, okay, then I know that, oh, okay. Um, like my ETC is 6.5 megabytes. Um, my boot is 56 megabytes and so on. So what this means is DU is just this usage, I guess. DU Dash H means um, human readable output. Okay, uh, why why the why does this flex? Because if you don't do it, then you will just report number of bytes, which is not very friendly for humans. So that's why you use dash H, uh, dash H. So then dash D one means that it just summarize up to one directory level. So if I do dash H D two, then you will just go to two directory levels instead, and so on. Or if I do D U H S. Then it will summarize just whatever I specify. So this helps you, this, you can use this to like, let's say you want to delete, you need to free up space on your disk. Then you can um, use DU to like find out where your big files are and things like that. Or which directories have the bigger files. Um, there's also tools like find to, if you want to just find big files. Um, yeah. Okay, and on Windows, on Windows you have this thing called Windows Start. So what Windows Start lets you do is, um, you just Windows Start basically analyzes your whole, um, like, all the folders and just tells you what's how big is each folder and so on. So if you ever need to like free out space on your disk, then you can just use this and find out where is uh, like where where are the big files in your system, and like you know you can delete the, those that you don't need. Um, there's also a graphical one on Linux called um, I believe Disk Analyzer. Yeah, so on Linux, if you want a graphical uh, disk, usage, disk usage analyzer, you can, it's called, well, disk usage analyzer. Um, actually, the code name is like Baobab. <laughs> yeah, it's basically equivalent to this. Yeah, so now you have a big bubble map of like, 
So you can just from a glance you can see which files are big. So this is like oh, this is a recovery environment. This is like a page file, and so on. And you can like zoom into like normally you just look into like your own user directory. Like let's say downloads. Oh, yeah. Then you can see like oh okay, um, I have you know a few megabytes here, and maybe I want to delete this. Okay, um, this step. Let me just close this. So this step is basically something that just outputs uh, system statistics on the go. Like, yeah. So you see that um, this is basically telling me, like every few seconds you update my CPU usage and my um, like how much my disk is being used, how much network transfer I'm doing, um, how much information is going in and out of page files, and I think this is the number of interrupts. So on um, Windows, you have multiple tools actually that you can use. Um, I think built-in task manager already has a resource monitor. But you know you can have you can like look at this. You have nice graphs. Cost is graphical. Okay, um, SS. The funny thing is, all of these tools I'm mentioning is basically built in. It's all in one tool in in Windows, which is Process Hacker. So I don't know if that is a good thing or bad thing to you. I mean, um, I suppose it's convenient, but you can't really. If you have to automate things, then you can't really like use Process Hacker in a script, for example. So what is SS? SS lets you view network connections, so I can like view what is being like where people are, um, what applications are connecting to what, and so on. So for example, let's just look at um, all the TCP connections. So we have a bunch of SSH connections from uh, NUS network. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah. So basically, these flags just um, these flags here just let you select like what so what which connections you want to look at and so on. Or you can just turn off. You can use ss a and then you view everything. But usually, there's a lot of things. Um, but sometimes you want to let's say a you want to view like open ports or what is listening, um, what your computer is listening to. So you can use ss-l for that. Or normally we use ss-lt. So we look at the open TCP ports. And so that so you see that um, oh I'm listening on um, port 7770. Oh, okay. That's my other that was the thing I have open. And yeah, I'm listening on SSH and yeah, that's all. I'm listening on local. Yeah, I'm listening on localhost uh, port 53, which is domain. Yeah. So um, what this address means, by the way, if you have 0000, or you have um, like this empty like colon colon, which is IPv6 equivalent of 0000, that means it's listening on all addresses. Then you have like colon colon one or 127.0.0. something. That means it's only listening on the local computer. So um, when this might come in useful is, for example, like right now if I a so there's something listening on port seven 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 zero here, and if I try and do if I try and listen in, if I try and open something else on port seven 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 zero, it tell me an error. So like if I uh, maybe I want to find out what 
what else is listening on like port 7770 and then like maybe kill it because uh, you know um, because you can only have one process listening to a particular port so like you sometimes you're like why is there something else listening on that port because I didn't start it you know and so you can use this tool to find out or you can the other, the other use of this is to like find out what your programs are connecting to oh and one more flag you can use is L, uh, P. So you combine this with LP, then you just tell you which program is listening to this. So systemd resolve is listening to my local uh, port 53. Um, my SSH server is listening to um, well, the SSH port. And one more flag actually, which is port um, N. So if you put N, then it, won't, it will just show the port number instead of the name. So that might come in useful sometimes. 6969. Six, nine. Yes. Hmm. Um, yeah. So again, <laughs> I keep going to Process Hacker because really on Windows, you have it all in one tool. So in Process Hacker, you have this network tab and you can just see. In process hacker, you can just see like you know what program is connecting or listening to what and and so on. Yeah. All right, we are on to the last segment. Cut. All right. Uh, how do I make the presentation slides? Uh, I use review.js. Yeah. Okay. So I guess, um, okay, I think the good point, good thing is that we managed to finish the SSH part and this uh, debugging part. I think those are the ones that require more explanation. So this network debugging part, um, all the information, all the slides are there. Um, if you have any questions, please do look at it and um, yeah, I'm sorry for taking so long today. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. Um, we will email you the video recording if you want to look at it. Um, the slides will be up like forever. So yeah, um, unfortunately I will have to take down the server like sometime later today because uh, it's not free. I'm using my digital ocean credit for it. Uh, but yeah, so um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us or email to